right, so my goal in part tonight was not to be so dense. <laughs> we'll see whether or not I'm successful. Um, so I'm going to focus primarily on the value, the cost, and the benefits of post-secondary education when we're talking about the five challenges that I'm identifying. And these are challenges that I think face students, future students, families, faculty and teachers, post-secondary institutions, employers, and governments. So fundamentally, these impact all of us in some way or another. And the first one I call loosely articulating the value of education. So chances are, if you've read an article about post-secondary education in the last couple of months, you've read some reference to personal benefit, to rate of return on investment, those kinds of things. Does that sound familiar? Well, much of our collective discussion about the value of post-secondary education has really focused on individualized skills development and the connection to the labor market. Return on investment, the ideas that go into that, uh, tend to be really universalizing. So we think about all post-secondary graduates making more money. Therefore, they have a return on whatever it is that they invest personally in their education. But this doesn't recognize that there are differences across programs within institutions by gender and by age. And it also doesn't take into account the cost of borrowing if people are borrowing in order to finance their educations. Further, we know that there are some significant social benefits that come along with post-secondary education. No, ultimately, no matter what kind of post-secondary education it is, we see uh, research that shows people with edu advanced education are healthier, they're more active in their communities, they tend to be more civically engaged, and financially, they tend to pay more in taxes than um, those with lower levels of education. And research that I've done, um, because one of the things that we see in post-secondary education trends in the Canadian context we've already hit on, the idea of demographics, is that attitudes among millennials and Gen Xers are different than attitudes among baby boomers around these kinds of things. So research that I did in just this past fall showed that Gen Xs and Millennials are much more likely to say that there are other important benefits to post-secondary education. They say that the financial piece is important, the connection to the labor market is absolutely important, but there are other things that matter too when it comes to post-secondary education. They're also much more likely to say that it's more important to get an education than it was 10 years ago, and also that government has a significant responsibility to work to ensure that everyone who wants to go on to post-secondary education in some form can. And my second point, my second issue, is about making that connection. So first I say, okay, yeah, there's financial benefits, there's individualized benefits, but there are social benefits that matter too. And the second point is about making that connection to the labor market, which again benefits individuals, but it also benefits us as a society. The connection between formal education and the labor market isn't always clear. Particularly for students, as it's been highlighted already, in fields within the arts and sciences. And part of that, I think, is what we're seeing in terms of the reflection in, in the retrenchment and the, the um, lowering enrollment in arts and sciences across the country and across most Western countries, actually, is what we're seeing. Now, one of the challenges is about deciding, as an individual, what kind of education is valuable. So not only what fits your interests, your ideas, what it is that you want to spend your time doing, but what's valuable in terms of what you want to achieve. Right? And one of my pet peeves is often that, you know, we think that people at age 17 or 18 have this all figured out. And lots of people do, but lots of people don't. And so reducing education to skills, to competencies, to things that are easily measurable is really problematic. Those things matter. Being able to say, you know what, I did this education, this is what I learned, this is how I can apply it, this is how my orientation to the world has changed, those things are all really important. And being able to articulate that is so important. But it's also really important to figure out how it is that students are deciding what's important and how it is that members of institutions, governments, are talking about what's important. So when we talk about the skills gap, um, there are certainly skills and training that's in high demand, and I think you would have to live under a rock 
in the Canadian context to avoid any discussion of the skills, the skills gap or the perceived skills gap because there's still, you know, the jury's out on that one whether there actually is a skills gap and what it looks like, the parameters, etc. And in Canadian history, we tended to focus on immigration to help address that, at least some of that in the shorter term. Um, we've also focused on um, ensuring that education is more inclusive so that we can bring people into um, systems that will meet their needs, but also meet the needs of, of the greater society. And I would argue that there's a role for employers here as well. And this is something that we don't talk enough about, I think. And we're seeing more and more, at least in the Canadian context, that employers want job-ready people. Right? They probably always wanted people who would fit, you know, fit the criteria that they're looking for in terms of the job. But there seems to be a little more hesitation, perhaps, on the part of a lot of employers who say that, you know, I don't want to train anyone. I don't. They should just come into the job and be able to do X, Y, and Z. And that's a very cyclical thing. It happened in the 90s, we saw it in the 70s, that same kind of attitude, invest, um, employers not wanting to invest in training. So we see these things over and over again. But I think that's something that um, we need to really understand and to really address when we're thinking about whether or not there's a skills gap and what that looks like. So my third issue that I wanted to address is the cost of post-secondary education, or the costs of post-secondary education. And it comes down to my first point. So first of all, if we're focusing on a system of education that is personalized, individualized, we're talking about individual benefits, then by extension, we expect individuals to pay more, right? It seems very sensible, it's very logical. And there's a lot of debate, there's been a lot of discussion in the media in the last couple of weeks particularly about the cost of education being offset Tuition fees particularly being offset by things like tax credits and student loans and grants and those kinds of things. And as Marlene mentioned earlier, we have a provincial post-secondary system. So we don't have any real national coordination um, and what you, as an individual, what kinds of tax benefits you get or what kinds of grants and loans you're eligible for vary pretty dramatically from province to province. Now, most people, according to research that I've done and research that others have done, perceive post-secondary education really as a shared responsibility. They may say that their benefits are, are individualized and that there are important financial benefits to the individual, but they see it not as the sole responsibility of an individual. They see it as, they see that individuals have a role, sure, individual students have a role, their families play a role, um, their partners, if they have a partner, can play a role. Um, but government plays and should play a significant role, according, according to most Canadians. Now, and this was the, the piece that I said earlier might be a little contentious. Um, in Manitoba, direct government investment, and this is for operating funds um, that are transferred directly to institutions, account for about half to 55 percent, depending on how you're measuring, of educational costs at universities in the provinces, for example. This used to be upwards of 80% in the mid-90s. So this is a significant change. And even though, as you rightly pointed out earlier, the number, the dollar investment has gone up, the proportion of operating has declined. And so institutions are spending more money on a variety of different kinds of things and that's being reflected in the increase in tuition fees, but also other kinds of fees that students are paying. So students are paying now closer to 30%, maybe even a bit higher. Now, Manitoba has held that closer to the 30% range because of the tuition freeze and because of the cap on tuition increases. So it's pretty dramatically different than our neighbors to the east and our neighbors to the west. So when I finished my PhD four years ago, I was paying three times what a graduate student in this province would pay. So not that I'm saying that's okay. <laughs> but it's a dramatic difference from province to province. Now the thing that I think is really important to recognize here um, is that we're kind of just letting this happen. We collectively, right? So as tuition increases, as government grants, government grants maybe don't keep up with the pace of what institutions think they need to be spending or do need to be spending, 
then we see this change happening over time, but until there are demonstrations or you know, enough mobilization, that's unlikely to change. And about half of all graduating students in Manitoba have some kind of government student debt. Measuring anything outside of government student debt is really tricky, as many of you in this room know. Um, unless you're, you're doing a survey of um, graduates or students who have access to other sources of funding, you're unlikely to be able to figure out what that is exactly. And people are notoriously terrible. Anyone who does survey research will know they're notoriously terrible about telling you any kind of dollar amount, any kind of accuracy. And so we know that Manitoba students borrow privately through banks and like other kinds of lending institutions. We know that they borrow from family and friends. We know that household debt is increasing. Um, we know that parental investment in uh, student education is increasing and the pressure to do so is increasing. We also know that for many Manitobans, and particularly for many women payers, um, the cost of education is not at all, um, in terms of the debt load that they carry, is much, much lower than what we see in the rest of the country. Now that's partly a product of having so many institutions in one place and having a big population in one place. Uh, students having access to a variety of institutions and programs while having the potential to live at home if that's an option for them. But when we think about rural and northern students, any students who have to relocate in order to access the education that they want, costs increase significantly. For graduate students, both full and part-time, costs increase. For students in high-cost programs and uh, many university programs, the costs are higher. For single-parent students, the costs are higher. So there's, you know, we tend to talk about students as being this sort of homogenous group of people when we know in actuality that the reality is very different for many, many students. Now Manitoba has introduced grants and bursary-based funds that help to address some of these issues. And in fact, as I said, Manitoba students borrow the least amount of funds through the Canada Student Loan Program compared to other provinces. So that is a significant difference. But again, there are trade-offs. So if governments aren't backfilling caps um, in or they have to reduce the grants that are provided to institutions, then there can be trade-offs. You know, post-secondary institutions can't provide as much access programming as they want, or they can't provide as many course selections as they might want to. Uh, they can't introduce new programs, make changes, those kinds of things are all limited. And related to costs, one last thing on costs, is access to information about costs. So not only are people notoriously terrible at telling you how much they owe, they're also terrible at estimating how much things are going to cost. So they go into post-secondary education and they say, I think it's going to cost me $8,000 this year, and then it costs twelve, And they don't have any money, and they have to get jobs, and or people leave, and there are all sorts of things that happen. And even at, you know, often the end of the year, people don't necessarily know how much they've spent. So identifying that, you know, we often say that information is power and it's kind of a, a tricky concept, um, but it doesn't necessarily translate. I mean, research has showed us that telling people, providing information about how things cost is helpful, but it doesn't necessarily change their behavior. So I'm just going to zip quickly through my last two because I have a feeling I'm talking long. I know. I'll be fast. <laughs> And these are pretty much everything that I have to say is interconnected in some way or another. But I wanted to just flag access and participation because this is something that we, you know, we've already heard a little bit about, but I think is worth is worth reiterating. I mean, it's something that the government in Manitoba remains committed to, um, but I think it, it's something that requires an investment of time, of resources, of energy from all of us. This is not something that one individual organization can solve. This is about making a place for people. This is about ensuring that people feel comfortable in institutions that we weren't necessarily created to make them feel comfortable. Um, we know that in Canada, we have the highest post-secondary participation rate of 18 to 30 year olds in any OECD country. We have a tremendous participation rate across the country. But we also know that there are significant differences in populations of people who have come from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds, from families where their parents don't have post-secondary education, 
where they come from, geographic locations that make it difficult to um, access education, and people whose high school um, experience was not as spectacular as whoever the model high school student might be. So we know that there are differences in Manitoba among First Nations and ET populations. First Nations people are much less likely to go on to post-secondary education. And while the number of sequential learners is increasing in Manitoba, in Aboriginal populations particularly, many students come back to post-secondary education later on in life. And so often our systems are really structured for the sequential learner coming out of high school, going right into post-secondary institution, when we know that's not the reality for a lot of, a lot of people. And if we want to make sure that we have an inclusive system, we have to recognize that that isn't going to be the way that many of our learners learn from here on. So all of this comes together in, I think, an issue for all of us again, which is about intergenerational equity and fairness. And ensuring that we have a system of post-secondary education that allows and encourages access, that provides people with opportunities, that allow them to do what they want to do with their lives and to participate in society in the way that they want to do so. And to ensure that what people experience now in 2014 is not less than what they would have experienced 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and is in fact better than. So I think that's that's where I would like us to see. And that's where I would like us I would like to see us go that direction. I'll leave it there. Thanks.